Well, thank you very much, um, Nigel, for your welcome and also for the invitation to speak uh, today about the theology of church buildings, which I freely confess is a subject I've never tackled uh, before. But it's been hugely helpful and stimulating for me to be, as it were, forced into thinking about this by accepting Nigel's very kind invitation. I expect you've all heard the story about the group of children who were being shown round the church by the vicar and who came to a memorial on the wall with a long list of names on it. These are the names of the people who died in the services, says the vicar. At which point the little boy in the crowd puts up his hand and says, was that in the morning services or in the evening services? Well, dying in church is perhaps as good a place as any, but what we're thinking about today is how our churches can bring life, uh, how they can speak a silent message alongside our spoken and enacted messages that will bring the life of the Kingdom of God to our communities. So let me begin by sharing three uh, conversations that I've had about church buildings. Well, they're in different ways, they're about church buildings. Conversation one began last Sunday evening as I returned home from church uh, from a prayer meeting at 8.45pm. Those of you who are fans of a certain ITV costume drama will appreciate the significance of that time. As I walked through the front door, my wife brought me a note. Apparently, someone called Gareth had phoned while I was out, and despite my beloved's best attempts to put him off, he had insisted that he needed to speak to the vicar that evening about a forthcoming wedding. Well, of course, I sighed inwardly, uh, but decided that the best thing to do was seize the moment and attempt to complete the phone call in time to make a cup of tea and sit down to watch the only programme during the week which my wife and I share together as a married couple. So I dialed the number and Gareth answered. He wanted to get married and apparently my church was the prettiest church around. I asked where he lived, but I had guessed by his confident manner and something in the tone of his voice that he was a member of the traveller community. We began to explore his geographical connections. His fiancée lived in the parish of St George's Chesterton. Some of you will know it, it's a suburb of Cambridge. But they didn't want to get married there because, as he said, the building was horrible. Uh, Incidentally, two days later I spoke to the curate of St George's Chesterton who said that her marketing tactic for weddings was to describe the building as striking. (laughs) Which is about as good a circumlocution as you can get. Um, Anyway, uh, with uh, St George's out of the running, Gareth explained that they had considered getting married in the church in the next door parish, which is St Andrew's at Chesterton. But this had been rejected on the grounds that the funeral of his fiancée's grandfather had taken place there, so it had bad memories. The discussion continued for a few minutes while we established that the couple had, in fact, no grounds whatsoever to be married in Histon, and I finally managed to hang up the telephone at 8.59 p.m. (laughs) Conversation two happened ten years ago when I was the vicar of a beautifully reordered church in Acton, West London, St Dunstan's East Acton, uh, if, you, uh, if you know it. This Victorian building had been radically redesigned internally during the early 1980s, long before I'd become the vicar. The architect was inspirational, taking the congregation on a theological journey as the design unfolded challenging them with questions about how they wanted their church building to speak about their faith in God, to echo what they believed. The result he produced was a comfortable, open, accessible space where the congregation gathered around the Lord's table week by week as the family of God. It was no surprise to me leading worship there that everyone from the youngest child to the oldest adult found a place where encounter with God at communion 
was commonplace. Remarkably, I learned that the reordering had taken place without disputes or disagreements among the congregation of any kind. And uh, that is in the face of a congregation that, shall we say, was of a reasonably conservative bent. One day, though, however, um, just having taken a funeral and standing at the door, shaking hands with people who probably didn't go to church from one funeral to the next, uh, as, I, as they were leaving, I had one of those moments that anybody in pastoral ministry will immediately identify with. The person three up in the queue decided to have a loud conversation that the vicar was meant to hear, but to which he couldn't respond because he would have been accused of eavesdropping. A woman who had lived in the area for many years, but who was not a member of the congregation, I heard her say, it's terrible what they did in this church, isn't it? Shocking! Uh, And I was left with two thoughts. The first, rather less charitable one, was that if only this woman had actually bothered to seek to worship God in this space, she might have found that it was uh, a very good place to worship and her opinion might have changed. But the second was that however good that church space was for the church and for the worshipping community, it clearly wasn't doing it for outsiders. So that's the second conversation. The third, much briefer conversation was a discussion with the former chaplain of Trinity College, Cambridge, just up the road from here. We were discussing the ins and outs of leading worship in the Trinity College Chapel. You don't have to bother doing transcendence, he said. The building does that for you. But try leading people to a place of intimacy with God. That's just impossible. And I thought that was really, really interesting. Three conversations, all of which I suggest have something to say on our subject this morning. What a good church building has to be and do for its congregation and the community in order to encourage the coming of the kingdom of God. Now I know because Nigel has told me that we come today from a wide variety of church backgrounds, uh, different experiences of buildings and different traditions of theology. And for some of us the church building has always been a key part of our seeking to proclaim the gospel and further the life of God's kingdom. For others, church buildings, and perhaps especially the way they are ordered inside, has been determinately marginal to our faith. But presumably the reason that we're here today is because we all recognise that a church building is never neutral. In fact, no building is ever neutral, uh, whether it's a church or a swimming pool, a classroom or a home. As human beings, we respond to buildings, to the spaces that we are in. They have the capacity to fill us with awe or despair, inspire us to worship or subdue us into silence. Ignoring a church building is simply not an option. A church building is going to say something to those who enter it, whether we like it or not. So we need to think very carefully about what we want it to say. And what I want to suggest this morning is that what church buildings ought to do is help and encourage us to live out the announcement of God's kingdom that we find in the words and actions of Jesus in the Gospels.